So I'm so excited to have Sharon Levin here. She is a book reviewer, a passionate teacher. You'll see she's very passionate of book clubs. She's a book evangelist in a non-religious way, whose main focus is getting great books into the hands of children and young adults. She served on committees uh, in the following organizations, the Library of Congress, American Library Association, National Book Council of Teachers of English, and the LA Times, a, a Young Adult Book Award Committee. Sharon co-teaches with her daughter, Elise, Black Civil Rights History Through the Lens of Children's Literature. It's a class to fifth graders and middle schoolers. Sharon's philosophy of literature comes directly from Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop, mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors approach, which I'm sure she'll give us more information about. Meaning that to see themselves, see others, and be able to step through others' shoes through children's books. Sharon, I'm so excited that you're here. I'm excited that um, I'm gonna call out our friend, Dr. Barbara Stroud, who's the one who I think introduced us to each other. Um, I'm so excited that you're here. I'm excited everyone's here and look forward to your energy. I appreciate Alba being here, um, helping us with interpretation. Welcome everyone and uh, take it away, Sharon. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. And yay, I'm not muted. Um, you're coming with me everywhere to do introductions. That was fabulous. Thank you so much. And yes, hi, Dr. Barbara Stroud, who I love and adore and have known longer than really I've been alive since I'm 29 and I've known Barbara for 40 years. I don't know how that works. <laughs> anyway, so we're going to go right in. Know a couple things. One, I speak really, really quickly. Slow me down anytime. Um, we're going to, Beth is going to be my, my goddess of questions, which means she's going to keep an eye on the chat. Um, questions are going to be organic. I'm not waiting till the end. If you have a question or a comment, if I mess something up, catch me. One of the reasons I teach is because I learn. I am constantly learning. Um, I am a cishet white suburbanite. I have a lot to learn. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and they. I have also learned as I go that when I now do panels, I do not ask for pronouns from others because you could be asking somebody to out themselves before they are ready. So all the things we learn as we're going, I use she, her, and they, by the way, because if people are not comfortable with a gendered pronoun, they is absolutely fine for me. Um, so we are going to start. I'm going to share my screen. I'm learning. Please keep in mind, I just gave up a flip phone two weeks ago. So I am just still catching up with the technology. So we are sharing. I don't know how to make that big. Oh, and I was reading it before we went. Ah, there we go. Let's go to the beginning. There's me, you know this. So first of all, thank you all to those who uh, filled out the pre-survey. It really, really um, helps. And I was going to ask, so I see family advocates and healthcare providers, preschool supervisor, and then I have other. Could you let me know um, out loud if you'd like to or in the chat, what other jobs, uh, professions, passions do we have represented? Um, yeah, does anybody so want to share? Free. Feel free to put your what you do if you're not one of these uh, kinds of jobs or roles at your agency. What kind of roles are you? Do you have other than those that we are have an early learning specialist? Excellent. Yeah, and we will be hitting books. Um, we're going to get to the the next slide in a minute, but we'll be hitting books in this talk for zero through five. Um, the resources I'm giving you, you can use those resources for all ages. Okay, I am going to see if the arrow works. <gasps> oh, Please good. Work. And there's okay. a director of school-based services. Oh, a wow. Librarian. There's a That's excellent. Yeah, lots of wonderful. Wow, you guys, are all, you all are all over the place. And yes, I will try and catch myself from saying guys. Um, and now here's why I try not to swear. <laughs> I hit the little arrow and I have a spinning beach ball of death in the bottom. That's what we call it in our house. Uh, yes, we see it. Yes. Do you see the spinning beach ball, Jess? Because I'm trying to go to the yes. next slide. So you might want to try to move your cursor towards the bottom of your screen. And then it's, there's a little air, a little um, back. There should the be. But with the full screen, it's not giving me any more than, oh, wait, can I go down this way? Thank you all for your patience. Oh, there we go. Okay. Well, that came from the spinning beach ball of death. So we'll see if it moves faster after this. 
So again, thank you all for those who, who responded to the survey. Um, we're looking at what you're looking for here. Examples of books to use with the use of different ages. And uh, yes, as, as um, Beth said, I teach a Black civil rights history through the lens of children's literature. We use picture books. Um, so I believe in picture books for all ages. There's also, of course, obviously uh, middle grade and young adult and um, the resources that are in this presentation have books for all ages, but I do really believe in picture books for all ages. And I will give you a, a small story. I took a, a Black Civil Rights History class from Jeff Steinberg, who runs a group called Sojourn to the Past, and Minnie Jean Brown Tricky, who was one of the Little Rock Nine, one of the nine people who integrated um, at much cost, uh, Central uh, High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. There were only nine of them in a school of 2000. So by, I mean, much cost, they went through a lot that year. And I was, this will surprise, well, no one once you get to know me, I was a student who always had her hand up. And I kept answering what the, the teachers thought were obscure questions. And they said, how do you know this? And please quit answering all the questions. And I said, uh, children's books. Every question I've answered has come from a children's picture book. So that's actually was how my daughter and I started thinking about our class. So books are good for all ages. Some of these books may be dark for your kids, the ones that I'm doing today. Know your kids. So again, we have people saying books are inclusive of different families. Yes, how to diversify my library. And yes, for whomever that is, the other fun part is going through the books on your shelves and calling the ones that are not great. Um, get rid of them all together. I don't know, that's entirely up to you. I have boxes of books I call my bad book boxes um, because they are my bad examples. And those are good too, not to read, but to hold up as a bad example. So this is the big question. What is diversity? This is not a rhetorical question. What do y'all think when you think of diversity? You want them to put it in the chat? In the chat, speak up. I'm good with people. Feel free to learning. unmute yourself. Yes, make sure you unmute first. I have that issue. Hi, this is If Vina. I were in person, I would be offering prizes. Hi. Hi, Vina. Hi. Hi, how are you all? Um, I, well, good morning. Um, I, I always think of di diversity as involving, um, it can be ethnic, cultural, it can be gender, it can be um, sexual orientation, socioeconomic, uh, folks, uh, people who identify with disabilities. So the list for me sort of goes on and it's um, in my mind looking at it as trying to be inclusive as well as looking at equity issues when you think of it. Um, so I'll take myself off my That was outstanding. Thank you. Yes, diversity is so many different things. Um, oh, did, Lindsay, did you want to say something? It looked like you were connecting to audio. Um, go ahead and speak if you want to. It, oh, sorry, I was just changing devices. No problem, just I check. I do talk a lot, so feel free to talk, you know, stop me. So yes, it's all kinds of things. It's diversity is what's different from the power structure, right? So our power structure is cis, het, white, mainly male. Um, so even if that group is in a minority, a numerical minority, they are still the power majority. I learned this when my daughters went to school and were in an ethnic minority. And yet the white parents and the white kids got more attention. It was a major eye opener for me. I'm sure it was not a major eye opener for you. And you're all shaking your head and going, we knew this lady, but keep moving. Okay, so we're getting into the books. I'm going to go slowly. Every so often I'm going to stop sharing so I can show you the interior of a book. Um, and I will be all over the place. if. You have a comment or a question on a book, feel, please feel free to speak up. I don't, as you can see my screen, don't have the chat open. So Beth will have to let me know if you put something in the chat and I will stop. Or again, just unmute and talk. I'm good with that. There have been I some, am every, there have what been, was that? I just wanted to call out that there have been some wonderful examples of diversity that people really um, shared in the chat. So, uh, and Vina summed it up. Oh, there. really? I believe the chat is also recorded. So that means we can go back and look later. I'm 
really sorry I missed what people were saying in the chat though. That's okay. Um, <laughs> um, I am every good thing just came out last year. It is an ode to black boyhood. We have a lot of issues books. We will run into issues books as well. But this celebration of joy and fun and gorgeousness is wonderful. It should be on every shelf. There is a two page spread and by two page spread, I mean that you have one, one illustration going over two pages or one large illustration. Um, a boy's playing in a swimming pool. And I've listened to the author and illustrator talk before and they said that was very deliberate because there is an ongoing stereotype of African-American children not knowing how to swim. There is a historical reason for this, as we all know, which was black children not have access to pools um, because either things were segregated or most times towns had one pool. If the town had one pool, it was white. So my town, Redwood City, which I love and is relatively diverse, does not have a public pool doesn't have a public pool. The wealthy towns near us have public pools. We do not. Um, so it's a celebration of joy. And again, there's in all good children's books, there's multiple levels. So in this one, there's, um, among others, the, the boy is playing in the pool and it's a nod to, we, ha we have access, hopefully. Um, and this is part of our joy and our upbringing. It is a beautiful book. These two also did Crown and Ode to the Fresh Cut, which I have listed in here, um, which is just a delightful read aloud. All because you matter. So as we're saying, um, books are at work on lots of levels. These are children's books. And you may think, you know, some of them go dark because, well, first of all, if you are, you know, uh, BIPOC, really you have no time to not know about racism. It's part of your life, unfortunately. I have parents in some of my classes say, my white child is uncomfortable with this. You're teaching them too soon. And I'm like, your white child has the privilege of having to be taught this instead of having to live it. So suck it up. I don't actually say that or I would have no students anymore, but I infer it. So a couple of things. Oh, stopping share for just a moment. Ah, here's me. So there's a couple of things I wanna show you with this book. First of all, look at that cover. The other thing, is this is so much fun if it's not a library book and the cover is not clued on always look under the covers look at that isn't that gorgeous so a lot of times in picture books there is a wonderful surprise for us under the covers and this is one of them this book talks about why people matter it's a beautiful ode to a child who is not yet born and then born the art is amazing and the part i wanted to talk about, as we talked about earlier, or Beth did, thank you, Beth, Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop, um, this, this line, or the first time you opened a book, like a mirror staring back at you, and really saw yourself, same hair, same skin, same dreams. And I want to remind, I want to mm -hmm. remind people that if they want to see these pictures better, they can uh, up on their um, their view, they can do a speaker view and be able to see or can pin Sharon's um, uh, picture so you can see them bigger if you want to see those pages. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. I forgot to say that. And yes, I'll, I'll be doing this a few times. So again, mirrors, windows, light, sliding glass doors, um, all are important. All are important. Uh, I'm at this point leaning more towards mirrors because so many people do not see themselves in books ever or only see or in popular culture ever. Um, I realized as I was looking at my list that I um, don't have any books with Jewish kids in them. That is not anti-Semitism. I'm Jewish. Didn't think of it as diverse. It's abs of course it's diverse, but I have enough in my home that I didn't think of it. I will come up with Jewish titles for you if you want them. Um, I cannot believe I did that. Um, also, a lot of times for books with, with Jewish people, and then they tend to go around our holidays or the Holocaust, just like Black American history is more than slavery. Um, Jewish history is more than Hanukkah and Holocaust. So we're still working on getting represented. <laughs> <laughs> so I did that. Bedtime bonnet. I mean, we're finally, most of these books you're seeing are within the past few years, right? We're finally seeing books that, that 
represent and mirror and then for for you know non non African American children they're seeing things that are a day to day life which is just lovely um seeing yourself represented means everything it really really does black is a rainbow color so this works for pride uh this works for black history month oh let me touch on that um it is great that we have Pride Month and it is great that we have Black History Month. And because you all are here, I think I'm preaching to the choir. Please like make these year round books. Like we can focus and say, let's acknowledge this month. It's awesome. But leading up to Black History Month, we're reading books. And after Black History Month, we're reading books. So let's keep reading books. Um, so it's great that we have these things. Pride is wonderful as I go off with my shiny squirrels, the San Francisco Giants are the first major league team to have a pride uniform that they will be wearing. Isn't that awesome? We live in a cool place. This is amazing. So Philip Freelon is the man who designed the um, Smithsonian African American History Museum in Washington, DC. If you have not had a chance to go to this, this museum, make it some time and give yourself three days because you will need to take it in slowly, work your way through. Um, so again, we have so much in this book. We have a, a African-American professional architect. We have the history of this museum that took a long time to come about. So we want kids to see people who are doing all kinds of different things. Or kids who are, with this book, Nana Aqua Goes to School, kids who are sometimes uncomfortable with how people in their family present to the outside world. I had a little Jewish grandmother with a very strong Yiddish Ukrainian, I should know what my grandmother spoke. Um, when she was born, it was Russia. Um, and I was not embarrassed by my grandmother, but she did have a really, really strong accent. And we grew up in Fort Collins where there were just not a lot of little old Jewish ladies, like none. So Nana Aqua goes to school. Nana Aqua has, um, has scarring from, from tattooing from, uh, from Africa. This is bad. Africa is a continent. Nana Aqua is from a country. But because I have a civ-like brain, I do not remember which country. And I know I have this book somewhere, but I'm not leaving you to go find it. And her granddaughter is worried about what kids will say what they will think of her grandmother, who she loves so, so very much. Um, and she does go to school with her. And it is wonderful. Of course, we're not going to have a book like this end in a horrible, horrible way. Um, it's wonderful. So it's an embracing of differences without being preachy. My thing with books also is that we don't want preachy. We don't want pedantic. We don't want lessons. If any of you are thinking of writing a children's book, and I know a lot of people want to, um, don't start with a lesson. Start with a story lessons will come. They are part of it. People remember a lesson when it is part of a story and not beating them over the head. Um, Shirley Chisholm. Shirley Chisholm was amazing. Not enough people know about her. Uh, she was the, you know, she was the first Black Congresswoman. She ran for president on the Democratic ticket. Um, she was actually not the first African American to get uh, votes on the Democratic ticket which I just learned by reading Cicely Tyson's memoir. <laughs> there, was, there was a man from New York, whose name I forget, um, who actually got votes, um, Democratic uh, primary votes. So, but she was the first. She's somebody that children should know about. She should be part of our popular culture um, and not enough people do know. And there's not a lot of books on her. So there we go. Little Mermaid, obviously not Black history. <laughs> what we also want is our books that are, you know, representative. So there's a couple things about This Little Mermaid that I like. Uh, for those of you who have seen the movie, lovely as the music is, the, answer, the message is shut up and look good and you'll get your man. It's not my favorite message. I love the movie. <laughs> From the Hans Christian Andersen, it's shut up, feel like you're walking on knives every day, and then die anyway. Um, so Jerry Pinkney, who is definitely an author illustrator, you should know any of the Pinkneys. The Pinkney family in children's literature is amazing. Authors, illustrators, editors, they're wonderful. Um, so he reimagined Little Mermaid. And in this one, 
she claims her voice. And again, we also, we have people talking about The Little Mermaid, the live movie I think is coming out and I believe that she's African-American and people are complaining because an imaginary character they visualize as white should, anyway. So we want representation everywhere. Aretha Franklin, I don't think I need to say more. It's Aretha Franklin. Also, um, Beth and Leah, just a quick question. Just give me a heads up when we're 10 minutes out. Above the rim, Elgin Baylor changing basketball. So this is Elgin Baylor, who was actually literally named after Elgin Watches, which is pretty cool. So we've got a man who, who was a great basketball star, but also during um, segregation. So his team was not allowed to stay in, or he was not allowed to stay in certain hotels, eat in certain restaurants. His team joined him. And this is good in so many levels because one, it's a great story, but also it's about how you don't sit by quietly when you see things that are wrong because then you're part of the problem. Um, this book and other books when they are, uh, nonfiction or historical fiction um, normally have back matter. So always look to the back, see what information is there. It gives you further reading. Look and see what kind of research they did because you never know if somebody got it right. Um, also, you know, look and see who wrote it and what their background is. This, again, look, it's a Pinckney. <laughs> Barry Wittenstein and uh, Jerry Pinkney did this book called The Place to Land. This is the cornerstone of um, our civil rights class. Well, one of them. Um, I guess you can have four cornerstones. So this gives you so much about the speech and about what happened, because we all feel like we know the speech, but we don't. I mean, first of all, we only know the lovely, happy, optimistic part at the end, which is great. But there's an earlier part where Dr. King says there's a promissory note and you owe us. Um, he was obviously not wrong and we still owe that debt. Um, so it's not just Dr. King, but the people who wrote that speech with him. Uh, it's about the night before, it's the writing and the discussing and um, on the pages of the other people who are with him, their names are there. So there's a lot of information about them in the back. Uh, we use this book also to teach that within any movement, any group, we still have our issues and our biases, but also the need to have when you're doing a movement, making sure that people can't use anything against you. The architect of the March on Washington was Bayard Rustin. Now I'm gonna put you all on the spot. Anybody know who Bayard Rustin was? And go ahead and feel free to just unmute and tell me. Don't you love it when I put you on the spot? Or give me a no, ha ha. Okay, I am going to jump in then. Bayard Rustin, as I said, was the architect of the March on Washington. We don't hear about him. One book was finally written about him by his partner, but it was not great. Um, he was pushed to the back of the movement because Bayard Rustin was, um, was gay. I say was because he's passed on. Um, and he was a very out gay man and they felt that would be bad for the movement. So um, this is how we learn about people. We learn who's, who's chosen to represent and who's not. The nine students, I think start off as 10 for uh, the Little Rock Nine, these were kids that, where they could find nothing against them and who would excel academically because when you're the first, the pressure is there to be the best. So Place to Land is a wonderful way to look at the March on Washington and also so many more people to learn about, in, excuse me, including there's a drawing of the young Congressman John Lewis, who did give his speech that day. He was the youngest speech speaker at the March on Washington, and he was told to tone it down because he was very, very angry. Um, and he did tone it down. Um, but he, of course, was angry and with good reason. This is Crown and Ode to the Fesh Cut, which is such a remarkable read aloud and so fun. And how many books do we see on Black Hair? Because we had Bedtime Bonnet. Yay, that just came out. Um, and, and, you know, Barbershop Culture and, and Black Boy Hair, which is, look at this. It's wonderful. And if you look, it won so many awards, which is great. Um, I'm going to point to this little Black award here with the triangle. That is a Credit Scott King Award. And yes, that is uh, 
Mrs. King, the, the widow, and sadly, have, of course, has passed on, of Martin Luther King Jr. And if you, I've got the link there. There are awards. Um, the CSK Awards are for African American creators. So there are author awards and illustrator awards. And they are very, very, the, the winners are amazing. This is The Undefeated. It is by Kwame Alexander and Kadir Nelson. Um, Kadir Nelson's art is just always stunning. He does a lot of New Yorker covers. Anytime we get a New Yorker in the mail and I see this something gorgeous um, and often very political, I'll like, that's a Kadir Nelson cover. I love them. The Undefeated are people within African-American history. Uh, you can see Frederick Douglass there on the, on the cover. Um, and there is one part which is amazing because the art is amazing, but there's one part where they just leave the spread empty. And I heard Kwame Alexander talk about this and he said a thank you to Kadir to actually, because his art is so wonderful and to give up the space. Picture books are 32 pages. There's not a lot of space. Give up the space to two blank pages. And those pages are about the voices we will never hear again. Um, the voices that were silenced. Um, and much as I am praising Kadir Nelson and his art, which I love, let me talk again about how sometimes we only see our own our own groups, or apparently in mine, I forgot to include my group. Uh, Kadir Nelson wrote a book called We Are the Ship, and it is about the um, the Negro leagues. And in We Are the Ship, I read it. It is stunning. It is a great history of the Negro leagues. Um, there are no women in it. There were three women in the Negro leagues. Oh, poor Kadir Nelson. Um, I'm, I was at, uh, I think it was called Baseball in the Morning. It was, a, um, it was a presentation at the American Library Association, and it was baseball. And there were various people on the panel, including Kadir Nelson, who was talking about We Are the Ship. And I raised my hand and said, um, I love the book. It's wonderful. Where are the women? And this was a love, not a great moment for Kadir. But a lovely moment for me because I had women saying, yes, Kadir, where are the women, including Sharon Robinson, Jackie Robinson's daughter. I got to tell you, that made that has made my life. Um, he left the women out because that was not his focus. But we were there. Um, women were in the, in, the, in the Negro Leagues. There were three. And as a matter of fact, there is a book that is not in here called Players and Pigtails because for any reasons, it's not diverse. Um, Players and Pigtails is about a league of their own. In Players and Pigtails, the, the women playing baseball on the field, there are black women. There were no black women in the women's leagues. The, a league of their own gives a small nod to that in that um, there's a ball that goes over the fence. There are three African-American women standing on the other side of the fence. One catches it, wails it back into Gina Davis, and they just nod at each other. And that is it, because those women are not allowed on the field. We need to acknowledge that, even as some barriers are being broken, other barriers are not. Um, so yes, so in the Players and Pigtails, they put the women there. And I actually asked the author about it. And she said, yeah, I know that's wrong. It's like, yeah, it's wrong. Put it in your back matter about why you only have white women on the field in your book. Anyway, let's not, let's not pretend things didn't happen. Sonia Dores mm -hmm. and sorry. Oh, go ahead. Hey Sharon, I'm wondering about a little about um, I don't know, maybe you're probably in a, but a question about um, authors and who they're writing about and uh -huh. you know, some of the books that you're talking about that maybe aren't so good, then sort of a little bit about who the who the authors are and what to look for in terms of authors and books. And are you asking about own voices or yeah. Yeah, yeah, and the okay. book talking about. Oh, and should I go back one, you mean, to this one? Or? No, 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 that, no, uh -uh. Okay. Just kind of a general question about. Kind of a general. So do look at your book creators. Um, own voices means that people from within a culture are writing a book. I am very careful about my opinions on this because, have we mentioned so many times, cishet white suburbanite. Um, so. Are own voices always the best? Not necessarily. Living within a culture does not necessarily mean you can do a good job writing it. And I guess, again, I'm trying to tread carefully here and I will put my foot in my mouth. Um, 
I know a book about a, um, a gender dysphoric kid, which is a great, I'm actually going to hit it later. It's a great topic. It was horribly written. Um, so I'm going to hide behind the words of Virginia Hamilton, who was uh, an African-American author and absolutely amazing, who said, I don't believe we can't write each other's stories because what you're telling me is that we can never truly know each other and I don't accept that. So I have that, but also own voices, people who have lived an experience certainly know it much, much better. Um, we need to do our research. You, there are things called um, sensitivity readers. If a person is writing outside their culture, there are people within cultures who will read it. Um, it's a double-edged sword. I think sensitivity readers are great. Um, the problem is, is sensitivity readers are asked to sign a non-disclosure agreement. So they could tell you your book sucks. You're all adults, I get to say sucks. Um, they could tell you your book sucks, but they can't tell anybody else they thought that your book sucked. So at the back, you could have acknowledgements that say, thank you to you know Leah Yancey for her sensitivity read. And it looks like Leah has said, has signed off on this book. And Leah's going, I hated this book, but I, I can't say that. And now I'm in the acknowledgement. So there's own voices. You do want to look at book creators and what they've done. You want to look at um, where they're coming from. Um, again, I tread lightly because own voices is very, very powerful. And I think, here's what I do think. I do think people within a culture should have priority on writing about that culture. Uh, what people in publishing literally hear is we don't need a book about an immigration story, which is what Dreamers is about. We already have one. Like, do we though? Do we? And is one enough? And how was it written? And what was your point of view? Um, so, hey, am I, is, is that, am I babbling now? It's great. Thank you. <laughs> was that you, Leah? I'm sorry. It, it sound, you sounded familiar, but it could have been somebody completely different. Um, Anyway, sorry, Sonia Doris and my Spanish, I'm sorry, is not great. Dreamers is a gorgeous, gorgeous book by Juji Morales um, about her and her son, Kelly. When they uh, um, came in from Mexico, they were undocumented. And it is the story of coming here and what it was like and dreaming. And there's a beautiful two page spread of them in the library because that was their magical safe place. Uh, any books by Juju Morales are amazing. That is one person where I can say I have no reservations ever, ever, ever. She's just brilliant. Follow her, get her books. We have other books by Juju in here. Um, even if, you know, and I would have both editions on your shelves. Have it in English, have it in Spanish. Make sure that kids are seeing their stories and their languages, that it should all be there. This is also Juji, just in case, the Trickster Tale. She has a counting book uh, in the Trickster Tale series. She has a Spanish uh, Spanish alphabet book. Um, this man is, well, is hilarious. Her, her, her art is stunning. And again, a lot of the books, it doesn't have to be an issue. It doesn't have to be a cause. It doesn't have to be a first. It just has to represent. So we want a, a broad, broad group of books on our shelves. Look when you get a chance, and I'm sure you are all doing your best to have diverse shelves, but look at, you know, the books we have with white people. They have everything, right? We're not just looking at white people issues. I'm trying to figure out what our issues are. But anyway, we're, we have experiences. We have fun. We have humor. So make sure that all those are represented for all cultures. It is Pride Month, which is lovely. Um, I was in San Francisco for the American Library Association when the Supreme Court past gay marriage. That was like the most beautiful day to be in San Francisco ever. And it did pass during Pride. So we want to talk about Pride. We want to talk about how different families, what different families look like. Um, anything makes a family. And it's just kind of lovely that Pride colors, of course, are so cheery and bright and rainbowy. And we can just represent, like I said, all year long. We want to, admit that we want to acknowledge that Pride is, is the month of June. But we also want to say that um, you know, we need to talk about this and acknowledge and know that people are part of our world 365 days a year. Pride Puppy is also by Robin Stevenson. I would recommend anything that Robin writes. She does a great job. Um, she is own voices. One of the things I love about this culture, uh, this cover was if you look 
we heard earlier what diversity is. And it's so many things. We have a person in a wheelchair on here. We have color, all colors. We have, well, not all. We have many colors. We have, it looks like we have uh, gender queer people, that we have NB, non binary people. Um, this is also an alphabet book. So this one just came out, as you can see, May 11th, 2021. So it's just, again, it's just delightful, and there's so much joy to it. When Aiden became a brother, Kyle Lukoff also is own voices. He is a trans man. And you know, it's a lovely um, pride shirt on there. And Aiden is very clear that when his mother is having a baby, that he will be the big brother. And again, these are things Kyle Lukoff's books have been banned. So many books are banned because people don't like anything what they say is different. Um, so we just want books to be there and, and have kids see themselves or see others and understand that, that gender can either be said, like Kyle Lukoff is very clear that they're a trans man, that they're very clear that they're male. And then we'll also have books for where kids are gender clear or non queer or non binary. And so all that is what we want to see represented. Call Me Max, same also, as you notice, Kyle Lukoff. Um, I do like all of his books. I think he does a fantastic job. Sharitha's big voice just came out. First of all, confession, uh, the second Sharitha David started running, I became such a fangirl. She is freaking amazing. Um, and a lot of times books written by celebrities or politicians um, are bad <laughs> because they start with a message or they um, are published because the person is a big voice, you know, it has a lot of clout and their books just, again, suck. Not this one. Oh, no, this is so good. I love it so, so much. And as Sharice Davids talks about, as a, um, I'm looking down because I have the book in my hand. Um, Therese Davids talks about that she was always outspoken, always had a big voice, um, talks about how she used her voice, the, the um, right, I love it when the phone goes off in the background, just um, how she's always had so much in her, and she's, she, there's so much humor to this, I'm sorry, I love this book, and it just came out, so I keep reading it and reading it and reading it, she is native, she is lesbian, um, and she is not as clear about the lesbian part in this book. I mean, she actually does say she's a lesbian and she does talk about her partner, but it's more about, she focuses, as you see, a native kid becomes a congresswoman. Um, and it's wonderful and amazing. And I'm just gonna keep babbling about it because I love it so much, so I will stop. Um, also, I'm looking and we're a quarter of the way through. <laughs> Bilal Cook's doll is so good. Aisha Saeed is again, another own voices, Anusha Syed the illustrator as well. Um, and it's a wonderful look at, you know, what what it takes to cook doll. Doll is, is lentils. Um, there's different types of doll. And so Bilal and their friends work on cooking the doll with, with Bilal's dad. And then they keep going out and it takes all day. So it's about patience and, you know, waiting and flavors and difference because at first Bilal's friends are like, it's this, this smells different. And this is, I'm not sure if I'm going to like this. And Bilal, of course, is very nervous. And for anybody who's had doll, of course, it's wonderful. And they also talk about the different types of doll, the different flavors and which kind they're making. And it's just, it's great. My daddy ma wears a sari. Again, Kashmir is chef. And I hope I said that correctly. Um, own voices, uh, as you can see, wonderful art. It's we again. We want books that talk about these. You know what's within people's cultures. What do we see? We are water protectors. Um, looking at the names, you would not guess own voices. Both Carol Lindstrom and Michaela Goed are Indigenous peoples. So look that kind of thing up. It's good to know. This came out of, of course, um, Standing Rock and other places where indigenous people have fought so hard to protect the water that is important to all of us, not just indigenous people, but they're leading the fight. Um, the art is stunning. There's a call to action without being, you know, it's not like, like what am I looking for? 
there's a call to action, but you're not saying, I feel really pressured now to do something. It shows you what to do, how to do, what we can do as a group to protect something that is vital to all of us. Eyes that kiss in the corners. Um, oh, gorgeous. I have had people tell me that this book makes them cry. It's lovely. And I've had adults tell me that I needed this book as a child because, Kimberly, did you want to add something? Sorry, I saw you connecting to audio. I did not mean to put you on the spot. Um, so where they felt different, there is nothing in this book that is negative. I'm looking for my copy. There's nothing in this book that is negative that is her fighting against things. It talks about how beautiful her eyes are and her eyes are like her sisters and her grandmothers and it flows. The art is wonderful. The author is obviously on voices, Joanna Ho. She is also a vice principal in the uh, Ravenswood School District here down in East Palo Alto. So it is just one of those books that works for adults and kids. People need to be seen. They need to be valued and loved and told they're beautiful. I talk like a river. So we talked earlier about um, different types of diversity. I talk like a river. Sorry, as you see me looking down, I should be more prepared. Um, there it is. It's right on top. Um, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. I am going to be pinned. Alba, let me know if I'm doing okay. So I talk like a river and look, let's go underneath again. It's gorgeous. This is about a child who stutters. Things sometimes, oh, thank you, Alba. Things sometimes don't flow. So I wake up each morning with the sounds of words all around me. So that's hard when words are not necessarily your friend, right? So I wake up each morning with the sounds of words all around me and I can't say them all. I know there is a middle grade novel called The Paper Boy that is about a child who stutters. I do not know of a lot of picture books that do that. I wake up in the morning with these words sounds stuck in my throat. And so he feels enclosed. It's very, very hard. My mouth isn't working. It's full with words of the morning. And then his dad takes him to the river. And they talk about how some words will flow, some words twirl, some words get caught up in whirlpools. It's beautifully written. Again, like I was talking before about books that will suck, uh, something that starts with a message. This doesn't start with a message. This is a beautiful flowing story um, about a kid whose words do not flow. So I'm going to go back to sharing. Let me know if I'm missing anything in the chat. There we go. And yeah, someone share. said that that book made them cry. So uh -huh. making a... Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. It does. I stutter sometimes. You may have noticed, poor Alba has, that I talk really quickly. And sometimes mouth and brain are they're a little apart. Um, so yes, I talk like a river is, it's gorgeous. And you can see on here, there's a, um, I'm pointing at my screen, like you can see, because I'm, yeah, it says a Schneider Family Award. I have the Schneider Award in the, um, in the resources at the end and the Schneider Award is for disability and lit. So those are really good books to know about. We need more. We definitely need more representation, um, but the Schneider Family Award is a good place. Also for those of you who are on Twitter and I have to confess, even though I'm not a techie addicted to Twitter, um, you can follow hashtags like disability and lit. Um, we need diverse books, which will show up later in the resources. And it's a really good way to learn more. There we go. Be Bim Bop again. Linda Sue Park, Own Voices. Um, she has written some amazing middle grade books. Absolutely amazing. She won the Newberry for a single shard. Shoot, like 20 years ago. Okay, I'm old. Um, and Linda Sue Park is from Korea. And Be Bim Bop is, as we can say, the delicious, delicious food. Um, she has a few picture books. Again, she's one of those people I, I have not seen any issues with any of her books, so I feel safe just saying everything she's written. The Firebird by Jane Yolen, not Home Voices, lovely white Jewish woman. Um, the Firebird is ballet that was danced by Maria Tallchief, who was the first um, Native woman to dance with the American Ballet Theater, I believe. And you can see her there in the bottom. 
Mm. Gorgeous. Oh my God, gorgeous. So the top, the, the whole book is split like this. So the top three quarters are what's happening in the story of the Firebird. The bottom is Maria Tallchief dancing the Firebird. Uh, it's absolutely stunning, absolutely stunning. And again, representation that we do not see and a, a ballet and a person I would not have known about if not for children's books. Now, I will say this book came out like over 20 years ago. So, okay, I caught on, <laughs> we want fun stuff. So Sumo Joe, um, again, own voices. And I just love this. Books that make me giggle at the cover are always fun. Grandpa Grumps, another giggling at the cover. <laughs> And a little granddaughter who is doing her darndest with him. Also, as we can see, grumpy cat, not the grumpy cat, but a grumpy cat seems to be in here. I don't mean to be speeding ahead, but I realize that again, I have a long way to go. Sheeran Yam Bridges, um, uh, again, a, an author I highly, highly recommend. She also used to have a publishing company called Goosebottom Books, which I did not put in here. So Goosebottom Books, Leah or Beth, you lovely people, if you would type Goosebottom Books into the chat, that would be awesome. Um, she has some wonderful uh, alphabet books on women in history, and they are very, very diverse, which are great. Ruby's Wish, also Sharon Yam Bridges. I'm sorry, again, sorry that I'm going on. Sophia Blackall is the illustrator on this one. We will run into Sophia Blackall in not a good way later on in this talk. <laughs> Grandfather's Journey, Alan Say, you can see he won the call to cop for this. Every picture in this book, not that you should cut your books into little tiny pieces, but every picture in this book is frameable. It is one of the most stunning things I have ever, ever seen in this Grandfather's Journey to the US um, from China. His parents were Chinese and Korean, I believe, Alan Say's parents. And it's his, what, these amazing oil portraits of his grandfather making the journey on his own. Again, most books by Alan Say are fantastic. Um, some of them are not as interesting, but I don't think it goes wrong anywhere. There's one I did not have in here called Kami Shibai Man. Um, I will not have all your favorite books in here. I will not have all my favorite books in here. There are way too many books and I had to stop pulling them. <laughs> Just so you know, I will miss books, but if you think there's a book I've missed that I really need to know about and I may not, please definitely put that in the chat. Also at the end of this talk will be my email because I'm very low tech. So if you want to email me suggestions or feedback, I would love that. I'm always, always, always learning because well, there are about 5,000 new books for children every year and I read as many as I can. Luckily, my children are grown, so I don't have to ignore them anymore. Um, and I'm trying to keep up as much as I can, but I don't always. Nim and the War Effort by Millie Lee. Millie Lee um, only had three books, I think. And her books are amazing. They're about her. Uh, Nim is Millie. And this is about World War II in San Francisco. Obviously, it was not being fought in San Francisco. And it was gathering newspapers. Okay, I just got distracted because my daughter just came in. Hi, Elise. <laughs> anyway, really, uh, Nim and the War Effort is about her. Uh, there was a contest in their school to, and I'm going to segue in a minute. There was a contest in her school to raise newspapers for the war effort. And it's Millie Lee going around uh, Chinatown with her, because you can see, uh, with her little red wagon trying to raise as, get as many as possible. On a weird segue, because shiny scrolls distract me all the time, Lowell High School in San Francisco has been um, primarily Asian for a very, very long time. It is a public high school. Um, the testing skewed one way. Two students, two students at that school, two students at that school, one Latinx, one African American, put forth, uh, uh, they are on the San Francisco school board. And they are non-voting members, but they are advisory members. They put forth a proposal to change the, the entrance requirements for Lowell High School in order to diversify it. I don't know if you all heard this, but Lowell has since changed their, their um, entrance requirements and is getting much more diverse. So kids make a difference, which makes me so happy. Anyway, Name of the War Effort, Millie Lee had another book on the earthquake 
she used to, when she, Millie sadly has, has passed away, but she used to, when she would come talk to schools, bring her grandmother's shoes around because her grandmother and her mother had been born in China and they did have bound feet. So in the 1906 earthquake, um, they had to, her father had to find a cart to carry them because everybody went to Golden Gate Park to get away from the houses and the fires and they could not, they could not walk. So Millie Lee only has three books. I think she has one more on coming in through Angel Island, which was the Ellis Island of the West. And it was called Paper Sun. And it's about how only boys were being allowed in, um, but they had to prove that they uh, were the sons, the actual biological sons of the men who were sponsoring them. Oftentimes they really were not. That's why they were called Paper Sons. Um, but even if you were a biological son of someone, the tests were horrific for you to get in. Millie Lee's father-in-law had to be able to accurately state how many windows were in his house. And that was based on the answer that his father, who was in San Francisco waiting for his son, who was on Angel Island, to answer. How many, this sounds like the, um, this sounds like the voting issues, um, voter suppression issues. How many steps from your house to your school? So there is her father-in-law trying his best to answer questions correctly um, and get into San Francisco. And he is literally just across the water. So fascinating uh, history of our area. Heroes, Ken Mochizuki, also own voices. Uh, he's only written three books, unfortunately, and these are probably at least 20 years old. But it's a little boy who during the uh, Vietnam War is always, as we get with natives too, the, the bad guys, right? We used to have cowboys and Indians. I'm really hoping children don't play that anymore. This was, they would play war and he was always told to be the enemy because that's who they were shooting at. It is an amazing book. He also has a book on the internment camps. They are all picture books. Again, picture books work for all ages. Know your kids. Anything by Grace Lynn is wonderful. A great celebration of mooncakes with a cover that makes you want to eat it. Grace Lynn is an author and illustrator. Sometimes she illustrates her own books, sometimes she does not. And again, obviously, own voices. It began with a page, how oh, Jio Fujikawa, sorry, drew the way. She changed the style of picture books. She was illustrating in the 60s. She wrote a book, did a book with um, like children represented from all ethnicities. It was huge and also here we are 50 years later and still trying to catch up, but she, she was one of the groundbreakers. It was wonderful. It's a great book. The art is gorgeous and they try and color, cover her style. Okay, here's a confession here. A Different Pond is awesome. I love this book. Completely went out of my head what it's about. <laughs> That's really, really bad. So we're going to go on. That is my brain. A Map Into the World, yay, a book I remember. We have a couple books, there are not a lot of books about Hmong culture. Um, and I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly. I believe it's Hmong actually. Um, we have a, a large Hmong community in the Central Valley. Uh, um, the author is Own Voices. This is a beautiful book about a little girl and her parents and her twin baby brothers. Um, moving into a, being in a neighborhood and their neighbors across the street, Bob and Ruth, put out a couch essentially during good weather and they sit out there and just watch the neighborhood. And there's different things that she wants to bring over to them to share her culture with them and their food. Her mom's always telling her, no, you'll be a bother. Um, it's a weird message from the mom, but okay. And uh, Ruth, oh, somebody call me, sorry. There's a, there's a question, um, interesting question uh, in the chat. How uh -huh. do you know if a book is from own voices um, without researching about the author? So is, is there like a label or a, anything on a book? Oh my goodness. No, but that is a great idea. Sometimes, okay. Don't you like how I know? Yes, and sometimes. Um, so for instance, in this one, there's always back matter. So I know it's own voices because I, does it say it in the front? Uh, no, but it tells it in the back. Like, so you'll have, I don't know if you can see this. Um, 
I always read the, the jacket flaps because I want to know about the authors anyway. So it tells you that she's Hmong. She's written adult books too. Uh, the Late Homecomer is fantastic. And besides the spirit touches you and then you fall down, which is written by someone outside the culture. I haven't seen a lot of adult books, grown-up books about Hmong culture. So how would you know? Lee and Lowe, and they're listed um, at the back. Here's a resource. Lee and Lowe is a multicultural publisher who normally get things right. <laughs> anyway, I just learned about a book they got wrong. Um, but they actually literally have an own voices award. So every year they are looking for debut author own voices. And it will say on a Lee and Lowe book, own voices. Other than that, are there labels? No. <laughs> that I can think of. Um, and yes, I love I keep disagreeing with myself. Certain book awards, Poor Bell Prey, which comes up, are Latinx um, creators, artists, and authors. So if it has a Poor Bell Prey award, it will be on voices. And yet I'm going to, to add to that. It will be somebody of Latinx descent, but it could be somebody whose family is from Mexico writing about Nicaragua. So you won't know that by a poor Abel Prey winner. Um, so you might have to go further into that. Coretta Scott King, the same African-American um, creators, authors and illustrators, whether or not they're writing from within a culture they know, are they writing about Ghana and their family is from Kenya? I don't know. So they wrote, there's own voices and there's own voices, right? We have to go deeper into what they know. That is an awesome question with a really convoluted answer. Um, a lot of times you can also go to the Google and type in a book. And yes, this means there's research. Type in the book, you know, title and then critiques or reviews because there will be things, there are books that are bestsellers that we don't realize have issues. Um, Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. That was a long and convoluted answer. A lot of times really look at the back um, with the author thing and that can tell you right away. So good question. Really good question. So, so answer. Um, <laughs> in this one, so Ruth passes away. This is a true story. Ruth passes away and I'm going to stop sharing for a minute so I can show you the end. And uh, pin me, please. And Bob is not part of the world because he has lost his Ruth, his Ruth who has been there for 60 years. So she asked her mother permission to draw on his sidewalk and she draws a little bit of everything, all the things she didn't, she wasn't able to share with him, leaves and a worm that she had captured that she named Annette because of course, Annette is a great name for a worm. So all the things in the world that she has not been able to share with him. And she look at that closing page and she draws on his, she has asked permission to draw on his driveway. And then his, that is his map back into the world when he is ready. It's just gorgeous. And we'll go back to sharing. And here. And there we go. A place where some flowers grow is, as we can see, on the internment camps. There are quite a few books on the internment camps. Um, and I apologize because internment camp is not the correct term. People were not interned, they were imprisoned. So prison camps. And what it was like there. Ken Mochizuko also has a, a book on the prison camps called Baseball Saved Us because that is what they played in the middle of the desert while they were penned in by barbed wire. It was something that gave them joy, not necessarily hope, but joy. And as we can see, the, uh, the illustrator is own voices. I don't think the author is, but I should look and see. And uh, a lovely, hopeful book. Um, I love, so Mira Theorem, and I apologize for the pronunciation, and I should look things up. Oh, sorry, and this is what I did not do. And this is not there. Okay, lovely Leah and Beth, can you type in teachingbooks.net into the chat so that we have it? Um, teachingbooks.net is an amazing resource. And one of the reasons I love them and forgot to look um, is you can type in an author's name and they will give you the pronunciation so that you do not mispronounce people's words because like misgendering, that is an assaultive thing to do. You need to get people's names right, especially when they are non-Anglo names. Um, so again, a, um, own voices, yellow suitcase, right? And remember, 
<laughs> still going. Um, so look, look things up. The Boy Who Dreamed of Infinity. I love that we have, first of all, um, so much of our math comes from, you know, Indian culture and Arabic culture, and we don't know. And my husband has told me, and maybe he's right, that algebra all is, of course, Arabic. And algebra, he told me, means really, really hard, which I would agree, since algebra is hard for me. Um, so again, we have people from cultures who have you know, who have huge impacts on us, even though we had no idea that they existed or what their art was or what their cultures were. Um, we have we have both people here. This is obviously own voices and the wishes of immigrants and emigrants. Uh, when we teach our class, we talk about the fact that um, when people leave a country, when they leave their home, there's uh, off and they're coming as as you know refugees versus Im immigrants. There's a reason for that. Things are hard and that's why we need to have open doors um, and open borders. Sorry, my politics come into this. If you cannot be in children's books and not be political, that's one of the reasons I like it so, so very much. The Most Beautiful Thing is also by Kao Kalia Yang who wrote um, A Map Into the World and it's another book about Hmong culture, and as we've established, she's own voices, and about, oh gosh, on so many levels. First of all, it's culture, it's respect for elders, it's family love, it's understand working together when there's just not enough money for things. This is her grandmother um, who has one tooth in her mouth. She had to raise her brothers and sisters. Um, the Hmong people are near Cambodia, but they don't have a homeland because borders keep changing and people keep fighting over their land. Um, so she had to do a lot of running and hiding and her feet literally have like uh, scars from the dirt that ground into her feet when she was little and barefoot. Obviously there was not enough money for shoes and she would, she literally ran away from a tiger uh, when she was growing up. So it's grandma's life and her grandchildren who love her so much and how in that, sorry, I'm looking to the side to find my book, um, how in their home, the the street, the thing that, that is the most important thing is getting to take care of grandma, which we just don't see, right? And we have... Um, we have that that cow's thing that she gets to she gets to take care of her grandmother's fingernails and toenails and she clips them and she files them and she takes care of her so it's just it's a wonderful book on family and pulling together and the most beautiful thing at the end many things are not allowed for cow they don't have the money and she asks for braces because she's getting older and she has buck teeth and as we know you know braces are really expensive and she's very, very upset. And her grandmother says to her, she says, Kalia, look at me. Grandma asked, is my smile not beautiful? In that moment, I could see all the times my grandmother had smiled at me. I could taste the cold ice cubes that melted summer's heat from our tongues, the sweetness of the hard peppermint candies, and the deep flavors of the bone broth in the bowls of boiled grain. Even now, I can still see my grandma's single tooth, white against the shadows, standing tall in her open mouth. Her smile was the most beautiful thing. So it's just lovely. And again, uh, an appreciation of elders and past and where we come from and where we're going. Knocking on wood. Again, did I know about this man before children's picture books? No, he lost his leg in a, oh gosh, I think it was a farming accident when he was 12 and went on to become a great dancer, which is just amazing. So it's like this, again, where there's joy and happiness and success and a person we haven't heard about. This is why we read children's books. Uh, Featherless Desplumado, sorry, Alba, um, is a wonderful book. There used to be a publishing company called Children's Book Press and Children's Book Press uh, focused on underrepresented communities. And in this one, this is a child who is in a wheelchair. So, um, and he has a featherless bird that cannot fly. The illustrations are gorgeous. It's a story of love and 
you know, um, I don't want to say acceptance because that sounds like this is bad. It's a story of love and being who you are without being pedantic. Again, if you start with a message, the book will be bad. The kids will hate it. Let's not do that. Brothers and Sisters is, as you can see, just mainly a, a book with, with photos. And we have uh, Down Syndrome's kids in here. We have diversity, uh, ethnic diversity. So we want books that, again, are just representative as well. That are not issues books. It's just, this is my family. This is what my brothers and sisters look like. This is who we are. What are your words just came out? Just, just came out. And as I mentioned before about pronouns, not using somebody's pronouns that they have asked for is it's an act of violence because you're telling them that you don't exist. I don't see you. You don't get to decide who you are. Um, so this is a great book, great entry into, let's talk about this. What is gender? What are your pronouns? You can change them. Um, it's up to you. So I love that. What are your words? So if you notice that the biggest word that I'm first, first of all, the fonts are great, but your is the biggest word because it is, what are your words? Who are you? You get to decide. So awesome book, really happy. Um, the long, like, I'm sorry. It's another one of those where I went, I love this book. Do not remember why. So we're, sorry. There's too many books in here. Two bicycles in Beijing. One woman is a, Teresa Robson is, um, an exchange student and just the life as two people keep passing each other by in this kind of parallel area. And then, you know, obviously meeting and culture meeting. I will be fierce is great, right? We've got, looks like a pride sweater on or pride dress, which is wonderful. Fierce is something girls, if they're gonna be binary girls are often told not to be or that it's a negative. Um, when our girls were growing up, we would tell them to be kind. We would never tell them to be nice. We would never tell them to be good. Nice and good tend to be traps for females and it's a way to keep us quiet. Fierce is awesome. Kind is fine, I, but fierce, I love it. Heather has two mommies. So we're gonna talk about this one. I do love Heather has two mommies. It is, you may have heard about it. It came out in the seventies originally by Leslie and Newman. Um, it is on Voices. Leslie and Newman wrote it for her daughter. Um, the first book, let me say this in a nice way. The first book was horrible. Oh my God. First of all, no editor. Self-published before self-publishing was a thing. And as pedantic as could be. It was just all message. Um, I had a friend who was a librarian who insisted on having Heather has two mommies on her shelf and good for her. Uh, she lost her job over it. And she said, now, not this edition of the book, she said, I don't mind losing my job for a book. Excuse me, I just wish it had been a better written one. It has been rewritten, which is why I'm saying these things. Leslie and Newman's books now are wonderful. I do really enjoy them. She has a young adult book called October Morning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, which is a book in verse about the murder of Matthew Shepard in um, Wyoming. And it will rip your heart out. Obviously not for the preschool kids that we're talking about now, but definitely later. So there's a, a reason I wanna have this here, two reasons. One, Heather Has Two Mommies is great. It broke barriers. There were literally bonfires burning this book, which of course meant people had to buy it. So, you know, that helped kind of. Um, and it's about a little girl who is goes to preschool and talks about her two mommies. And then people are like, you have two mommies. And so the teacher has them go home and everybody does drawings of their families. In the original Heather Has Two Mommies, the teacher has put the drawings up on a wall. And there's a drawing of a kid with his family and a sibling in a wheelchair, which is great. So now we have representation in this book that came out in the 70s. Um, and in this copy of Heather Has Two Mommies, the kid in the wheelchair is gone. So again, like with Kadir Nelson and We Are the Ship, sometimes we have our blinders on and we make sure that our issues are hit and forget about others. And I did ask the author because I was at a, a book conference where she was presenting this, it was the second book, it was just coming out. And I said, well, what happened to the child in the wheelchair? And she said, oh, my, aunt, my editor said I had too many words in the first book. I said, well, yeah, <laughs> but this was just a picture. So without a second thought and Candlewick Press, that's at CP up in the left corner is normally a very good aware publishing house, but they missed it on this one. 
So we're, again, we're learning. Maryam's magic. Maryam um, was a woman in Iran. Um, this is really bad if I mix up Iran and Iraq. I am very sorry. I have, do have it here. <laughs> she really, uh, it was Iran, thank you. Um, uh, she really, really hated math until she got to, ge but she loved to draw. So then she got to geometry and went, oh, well, this I get. And she really, she was the first woman to win the, oh, there's a prize. It's like the Nobel Prize for Math. Did you know there is not a Nobel Prize for Math? Do you know I learned that in this book? So there's a specific prize that she won um, because of the way she approached math, the way she made everything pictures. She was local to us. She was actually um, in Palo Alto. Her husband taught at Stanford, as did she. So multiple representations here. We have a woman in math. We don't see that a lot. We have a woman from Iran. Um, and it's a woman that we don't hear about. And we should, but we don't. And where do we hear about her children's books? Because you're not going to find a 200 page, we should, but we don't, 200 page grown up book on Maryam Mirzakhani. But we will find a 32 page children's book on it. Amira's Picture Day is about Eve and it is own voices. Um, as we're talking about books, I'm going to send you all to a movie. If you have Disney Plus, and I know it is getting prohibitively expensive, and Disney has many, many, many issues. Disney Plus has a thing called Launchpad, and it is short movies focusing on uh, multiculturalism. And there is one about uh, Eid, an American Eid. They're all about 20 minutes. They would probably be fine for your preschools. Um, check them first. I've only seen uh, two of them so far. And it's about trying to celebrate Eid here when you have just left Pakistan and your family there is celebrating and you don't get school off in America for Eid, right? Um, even though in theory, we have a separation of church and state, please notice it is only Christian holidays that we get off. So Amira's Picture Day, and again, Own Voices, is about Eid and her family is letting her take the day off of school, which is wonderful. But she also realizes it's picture day at school. And she really wants to be there because it's it's the, the class picture as well, not the individual picture that could be made up, but the class picture. And it's about her celebrating Eid and how Eid is, is, cele is celebrated and, and the food, which is of course amazing. Um, and also wanting to be at her school for picture day. And she does get to be there. So spoiler alert, she gets to be there. She brings Eid treats. Is there a question? Yes, there's a question. There's a question, Sharon. Um, do you highlight any self-published authors? I don't. Um, don't. Okay. I don't. And that is not um, to say there are not good self-published books. In this talk, as far as I know, there are no self-published books. Here's, here's the thing. Um, Again, there are 5,000 uh, uh, traditionally published books a year. Within those 5,000 books, even going through the editorial process and all kinds of things, we still have a lot of books that, as we have noticed, is my favorite word now, suck. <laughs> That's going through the process. Um, there are some very good self-published books, but there's a lot, there are a lot, I can do verbs. There are a lot that are not because people are writing their books with the message. There is not an editor to help them out. I just wrote a review that took four edits. So editors are really good. Um, so there's not as many, there are not as many steps to making sure that the book is well done. And because there are 5,000 traditionally published books, and I try to get through as many as I can, if I include self-published books into that, it will probably triple the amount of books I have to read in a year. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. <laughs> that being said, if you know of any uh, self-published books um, that you like, please do let me know. I will look for them um, because sometimes because the gatekeepers in publishing still there's, and much as I love the publishing people, I know there's still a lot of institutionalized racism and the barriers are there. Um, and so I do know people who have only been able to do diverse books through self-publishing. It's just, I can't read them all. So again, I am, one of the reasons I'm out here is please tell me what books you know. Um, and I would love to see them, but there are, there are a Thank lot. You. You're welcome. Okay, <laughs> so anyway, I do love this one. At the, and there is of course, 
as we love, I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. Back matter. I am a back matter nerd. So information on Eid, information on the author's note, glossary and pronunciation, all good. The kids may not always care about the back matter, but I do. And you can read the back matter, obviously, and then incorporate it into um, incorporate it into your telling of the story. And of course, being me, any book that includes food, while you're reading the book, eat the food. Food is good. Um, Jojo's flying sidekick. Look, it's a Pinkney again. I do love the Pinkney family. This is an old, old book. And as I already called her out once, my daughter Elise is here with whom I teach the Black Civil Rights History class. This was one of her favorite books growing up. Jojo is, and Brian Pinckney's art is gorgeous. Jerry Pinckney, um, who you saw with Little Mermaid, is Brian Pinckney's father. Um, Gloria Jean Pinckney is Jerry's wife and Brian's mom. She also writes. This is about a little girl who is afraid of the tree in her front yard, which makes sense because it scratches at her window at night and it's big and it kind of looks like it wants to eat her and her going to school to karate school and learning how to do a flying sidekick so it's a little girl who finds strength within herself again without being pedantic um who who um, confronts her fears who literally kicks ass kicks butt and again you're grown-ups i would never use the a word if i were talking to your students um and we have representation without it being the the set the plot wonderful festival of colors uh illustrated by vashti harrison's and obviously we can look at the author Segal, um own voices and there's so many lovely lovely holidays that we don't celebrate or know about that kids love we have to be careful when learning about them and teaching about them that we do not other right when we don't tokenize but that we embrace and talk about things and be ready to answer questions um oh anything by juana martinez now is fantastic it's probably neil and i'm just going with hispanic but um sonia's rainforest is beautiful and as you can see an indigenous child it's gorgeous um lucy soars we've got again um amazing colors. We have an artist. We have pride. We have everything. I love it. I'm sorry that I'm going quickly again, but I'm also seeing I have 36 minutes. And again, anytime questions, get in there. Moon was at a fiesta. Not own voices by the author, uh, but um, the illustrator is Mexican. Matthew Golub is, um, is American, is Jewish, Jewish American, who also speaks Spanish and Japanese. Um, so he's fluently trilingual. And I love this story. It's based on a, a Mexican folk tale where when the moon is out in the morning, the saying is uh, the moon was at a fiesta and was out so late and having so much fun, she forgot to go to bed. It is told in English and Spanish. I think you can also get the version entirely in Spanish. So I do, I love this. And every time now, still, if I see the moon out in the morning, it's like, I always say the moon was at a fiesta. Alba, I'm going really fast. Sorry, I just realized that. Evelyn Del Rey is moving away. Meg Medina, uh, own voices, um, write picture books and middle grade. And I think she's got a YA out there. And it's about friendship and love and what happens when your bestie moves away. And it's just you know, something that children experience. And it's so, so, so hard. Juana and Lucas, Juana Medina, also uh, an author that I adore. And you can see here, this is our Pura Bel Prey Award. Pura Bel Prey was a librarian in Brooklyn. Sorry, oops, how did I go back? Oh, no, I didn't. Uh, she was a librarian, I think, in Brooklyn. I'm sorry to anybody from New York. I'm not quite sure which borough she was from. Um, there are books on her as well. There's one called The Storyteller's Candle that I wanted to add, but I could have kept adding books till 5 o'clock this morning, and that would be bad. Um, so, Someone did ask a question about. They did. Um, yeah, will a mirror book, will uh, will a mirror book be a, if let's see, will it be a mirror book if a character doesn't look like you but you can relate to their story? That was a question someone had. Well, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. I love that you're asking me 
like no who knows so i think it's the <laughs> idea of a book mirroring who you are and maybe no i agree um yeah it can be a mirror book if they don't look like you because mirrors are not just what we who we are what we look like right if you feel seen story it's a mirror book what was that um beth yes i i that makes sense to me what you just said about being a mirror book that it's not just you know it can be also be the the story i guess or the what right. they're experiencing exactly so that is a really really good question and point yes mirrors windows sliding glass doors one book can be all three for somebody, right? Depending on the experiences in there. One book may be one of, it can't not be any of them, right? Because either if it's not you as a mirror, it could be a window or a sliding glass door for you to see somebody else's experience. But yes, anything that, that resonates for you and for your thank experience you. is also a mirror. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes, whoever asked that, that was awesome. Um, so yes, Poor Belle Prey, great award, look it up. Storyteller's Candle, which I believe is told in English and Spanish, is a great book. Um, so, and she made a huge difference on people. Gustavo the Shy Ghost, it's just sweet and wonderful. And you know, it's Gustavo. Again, any book that makes me giggle at the cover is wonderful. Brown Baby Lullaby, Again, this is something that we want all our kids to have, right? Regardless of ethnicity, I believe all kids should be read Brown Baby Lullaby. It's just wonderful and loving and positive. Um, and look at that art. It's just, it's so pretty. Building Zaha. So she was this, is this amazing architect. Um, she did, she was not being heard. You know, women don't design buildings. You may be an artist, but you don't do this. And um, she her vision is so incredible she did a fire station that looks like a bird with wings taking off so it's it's architecture as art which we love not all architecture is art um it's a woman breaking out into a field where women are not thought of it's a, a non-white woman breaking into a field again there's a lot of back matter in this book so we can learn more about her and other women um it's it's wonderful Feathered Serpent and the Five Sons is a Mesoamerican creation myth. And uh, it takes you through the creation of people. Like they're trying to put people together in various ways, but the, the bones aren't holding together. And, and you know, the, so they become fish and they become mountains. And there's all these other things before um, Feathered Serpent's like, I want to try this um, and has, of course, overcome obstacles and and uh, physical and mental and then gets to the end and when feathered serpent decides to create people they ask the gods to put in some blood and then the bones hold together and then the people happen and really we don't get a lot of mesoamerican creation myths um duncan tonatui and i'm hoping again i should have gone to teachingbooks.net all his books are amazing his art all looks like this it's gorgeous um and again he very nicely puts in back matter which i appreciate and i think is this one of the books with a different oh and i'm going to stop sharing for a minute because as i said sometimes there are treats and we've got this gorgeous cover and then we have this gorgeous cover so you can always do the cover reveal with your students and it's so fun okay just sharing the screen um share there we go we're doing okay great 30 minutes 40 pretty fine todos iguales all equal so i'm assuming most of you have heard of brown versus board of education do me a favor and give me a thumbs up if you have in the if you have the reaction thingies um, and i'm just peeking to see if i'm seeing thumbs up and not seeing a lot of thumbs up. Of course, I'm not very good at looking at all of these. Yes, I'm seeing yeses, yay. So um, for the non yeses, oh, thumbs up, yay, people, good. Brown versus Board of Education, yes, in theory, ended segregation in our public schools, in theory. Um, still working on that. So Totus Igualis, All Equal, is about the case in Lemon Grove in California, where a lawsuit was brought in the 1940s. 40s because Latinx kids were being, they were going to segregate 
them and keep them out of the white schools. Um, there are a couple reasons why this is not as well known as Brown versus Board of Education. The biggie is um, they won. So, so the full the school was fully integrated. So there was not a reason to go to the Supreme Court. And also, we just don't teach Latinx history in this country or in this state. Little things about this book make me love it more. One of it is a lot of times when you see a bilingual book um, in any, well, in English and another language, English always comes first. It is so when you have the, the non-English language second, it treats that language as a translation versus as the text for the book. Codus Igualis, Spanish is first. It's, as you can see, first in the title, first in the subtitle. It's wonderful. Christy Hale is a local author illustrator by local, uh, I mean, Palo Alto. And um, there's a lot of back matter to this. There are very few books on this. I've seen no other picture books on it. It's touched upon in a book by Pam Munoz Ryan that is meant for middle grade. And I completely forget that book, even though I can see the cover. I love this book. It is amazing and it teaches us so much. Vamos, let's go to market. Vamos, let's go eat. The Art by Raul III is always so lively and so fun and bringing in, in Mexican culture, like when they're going to market, they're passing all kinds of, of different vendors and they're delivering things. And again, lively fun, bringing in vocabulary. It's not fully bilingual, but there are a lot of words in there that are not translated, which I appreciate. They're just part of the context. So you are learning from context. And again, very, very just entertaining. And you can see that there are poor Bell Prey Awards on these. Raul the Third, I would do a search. They have all kinds of books that are wonderful. Ohana means family uh, for any of you or your kids who have seen uh, my Lilo and Stitch. We all learned that Ohana means family. Um, this one is told in the cadence of the house that Jack built. And it talks about um, uh, Hawaiian culture and the growing of taro root and the making of poi and the history. And it is, again, we don't have a lot on Hawaiian culture. Um, there is a book, as my brain jumps around to the shiny squirrels, there's a book about, by Diane Stanley, S-T-A-N-L-E-Y, about the last princess of Hawaii and how we totally, um, okay, you're grownups, how we totally screwed over the state and made them become a state. They did not want to become a state. So for when your kids are older or even, and I don't even know if it's still in print, but Diane Stanley has a book on what happened to Hawaii and how it got forced into the United States. It's amazing. Ohana means family. It's a fun read aloud. Um, and just really, really lively because it's a, the cadence of the house that Jack built, which is really fun. Small things and is not a small thing. I'm going to stop sharing for a minute and show you the book. When whoever it was, and I apologize for forgetting names at the beginning who defined diversity so, so, so well, and I so appreciate that. And you talked about neurodiversity and you talked about ethnic and socioeconomic and gender and family. Thank you. That was an amazing, um, amazing definition. This is about anxiety. This is the book I bought six copies of because it's for kids. It's for grownups. It's um, the, the little things that make us feel either in or part of a group. It's largely wordless which I love, I will not, so um, one of the reasons I hate reading levels is because wordless books don't come in under reading levels, even though they are incredibly complex. You can see this child trying to break into the group and feeling lonely, feeling left out. And you see here, the little kind of black jagged things that are showing for their anxiety. And the only words you have in here is watching this child try to do a test and having it not come out well. Here's their anxiety following them again. It shows them in the middle of a group of kids with their anxiety and everybody else looks fine. What's amazing about this book, and it opens up so many discussions, is just seeing how this child reacts 
how it makes them act out against other people, what it's like trying to go to sleep at night. This is such a conversation opener because obviously kids and adults have anxiety and kids and adults often do not have the words to talk about it. And realizing that many of us have our anxieties and people don't see them or we think people don't see them. It's, it really is, it really is an amazing, amazing book. And also how reaching out sometimes helps to calm your own and others' anxieties. It's, again, not a message book. It's not pedantic. Well, it's not pedantic. There's obviously a message. Um, and wordless, which means that the child can tell you what they're saying, which is just incredibly, incredibly empowering. Okay, Yo Soy Muslim, which we love, right? Because we we have obviously uh, Spanish and Muslim own voices and the father telling his daughter what this means, that Yo Soy Muslim, which means you are also Muslim. Leslie and Newman is back. Yes, Heather has two mommies, getting much better these days. Mommy, mama, and me. Visiting day. So again, I don't, not everything is an issues book. And um, this is one of the most beautiful books I've ever seen about a little girl who is visiting her daddy in prison. And there's a few reasons I, I include this one. One is because it is frigging gorgeous. Um, it's the girl prepping to see her dad. It's the dad prepping to see his daughter. You do not know why he's in prison. It does not matter. She loves him. He loves her. Um, every other page, one page is a girl's story getting on the bus to go visit. The next page is uh, the dad getting ready for her to come visit. Um, there is a two-page spread. Again, that's when two pages are one painting that's wordless of when they have to be parted again. It will rip your heart out. And she's looking over her shoulder at her father and he's looking over his shoulder at her. And it's the love is palpable. The pain is palpable. And again, we don't know, I was talking about my friends, you know, being sad that I introduced their white children to racism. We, don't get me started. We don't know um, what people's stories are. So for instance, I was, book talking, like what I'm doing for you all right now is a book talk. I was book talking books uh, to a class of teachers and I had this book and one of the, and I said, and we don't know kids' realities. And one of the teachers said, one of the children in my preschool said, I'm so happy today. And when they asked her why, she said, my mommy's getting out of prison. They didn't know her mom was in prison. So we don't know and people need to be seen in all their experiences, excuse me. When Jacqueline Woodson, and if you haven't read books by Jacqueline Woodson, go read everything she has ever written um, because she is amazing. She also writes up through YA and adult. Um, when she wrote this book, it was because her uncle had been in prison, which she touches on in, uh, or talks about in Brown Girl Dreaming, which is an amazing book. And most times, this may, for those of you who are writing or considering writing books for illustrating, most times authors and illustrators do not meet ever, ever, ever. Authors do not choose their illustrators pretty much ever, ever, ever. Everything goes through an art director. Uh, was there a question? Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. fascinated by what you're saying, that they don't choose, that, they, that the author doesn't choose their illustrator. Um, but someone asked a, a good question. How can we as an educator tell the difference between a book that displays tokenism versus one that is truly diverse? Ooh, I love when you ask me questions. I have no idea how to answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, part of it is, and was, was that um, question prompted by this book in particular? I'm not sure. Um, okay. if the person who wrote that, uh, Kiona, if you wanna unmute, feel free and, and ask your question what brought that. Certainly don't have to, but uh, you don't have to. But if you want to, or put it in the yeah. chat. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, just because um, sometimes I go through a lot of books, and mm -hmm. sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between like a book that's saying, okay, just basically displaying tokenism. We're going to put this brown kid here just to say that we're diverse versus a book that's actually diverse just so that we can represent our be not be harmful to the community we serve so I just wanted to go I just wanted to know what your insight was a little bit on that particular topic 
That is a very good question. I don't know how well I will answer it. Some of it, I think, is gut feeling. Some of it is, I think, asking people within a community. Um, it, if it jars you, and we have a book coming up that I will show you all that I felt did do tokenism in a really bad way. Um, actually, just did tokenism because you can't do it in a good way. Um, <laughs> so, I, so good question. As I flounder, I think a lot of it is is gut feeling, seeing how people are represented. There should be in any group or any background, depending on obviously where the story is taking place and when, hopefully the people in the book and in the crowd scenes, whatever, are diverse um, ethnically and abilities wise and, and gender wise. Yeah. I um, like what you said earlier too, Sharon, about, you know, Google it and look for reviews on the book too. See what people are saying about, yeah, especially what within a culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we will come up on this later and I will, I will say that this is Beth's cousin-in-law. Dr. Debbie Reese runs American Indians and children's literature. And let me tell you, yeah, Debbie does her work and knows her stuff. Yeah, I'll put, her, her, about I'll put her website in the chat. Yeah, and oh, she's also in my resources at the end. Um, so I will, look, if it's native representation, I instantly go to her blog and check and search on the book. Um, part, of, part of it is, I think part of it is gut reaction. We also have to know that like stories representing different groups at different times, for instance, in Visiting Day, both Jacqueline Woodson and James Ransom have um, had families in prison, and they felt that their the kids in their lives needed to feel that representation. But in again, in a positive way, what it is is a father and daughter love each other. That is the story of this book. Was that helpful or was that babbling? No, that thank you. No, that was helpful. Um, this. That question actually wasn't prompted by this book. I posted it earlier and it oh, didn't did get answered. So I reposted right. it. But um, yeah, I just Thanks, kind of Kiana. wanted to. Yeah, thank you. Are there, are there, I didn't I'm mean, sorry, what was, you what was your name I again? Mean, I didn't mean to cut you off, Kiona. I just meant that I'm sorry I missed it. And thank you for reposting it. No Kiona, problem. are there, are there books that have, have, like you've read them and they've instantly, you've gone, no, this is not okay? Yes, there have been some that like I to picked share up. them. Um, I don't have them anymore, <laughs> um, just because um, I've, they've been okay. donated to our program, and I've looked at it, and like you said, had a gut reaction, and I'm right. like, yeah, you know. And then there have been times where I've looked at that same book, and I was like, okay, this is okay. And then I look at it a second time, and I'm like, no, and I just kind of put it aside. So that's why I just kind of wanted to talk about that topic a little bit so I can have a little more insight when looking at books initially before I put them out to our families. Right, makes sense. Um, and you might even, there may be parents within your families where you say, you know what, not sure about this. What do you think? Or also um, whatever social media you may be on and you don't have to be on any, but you can say, I'm reading this book, you know, hashtag whatever it is about it and see if you can get insight. And again, going on Google. Um, but if you can, if you think of the titles, I'd love to see them just to know what you've, what you've winnowed out. And we can share that later with everyone too, because it's good to know. But yeah, if you turn a page and go, whoa, <laughs> that's always, and we're going to hit a couple books that are whoa. So thank you. I think, yeah, I don't have a good solid answer on that. Gut reaction is good and check with the community. So thank you for that. Um, we are little feminists, because, you know, we are. And again, lots of representation, which I love. Also, feminist is not the F word, even though it often is treated that way. Um, so I love this. And Little Feminist is a publishing house, and I believe they are local, which is pretty cool. Love makes family. Again, diversity, look at that. It doesn't beat you over the head with the message. It's pretty clear. But again, you know, we have people who still don't accept differences or don't see them in, or they think they're not seeing them in their lives. So we just want representation. My family, your family, same kind of thing. Families are all different. And we talk about families of choice too and how kids may have, you know, aunties or uncles or tias or tios who are not blood relatives, but they're absolutely family. Same thing, love in the wild. <laughs> I mean, come on, look at that cover. Um, I just, I, it's one of those that makes me grin again. And it's got, you know, animal couples. Baby's first words. Again, I love it because we have, you know, obviously uh, 
to gay dads, multicultural, multi-ethnic, um, and multi-language. There's probably another word for that. Barefoot Books is a good publisher. Keep them on your list. I do really like them. Our Rainbow, Little Bee, does a great job. They have Little Bee, and then their older books are Yellow Jacket, which is an interesting publishing choice since I don't normally have good thoughts about yellow jackets and their things. But Little Bee has a lot of really good books. Our Rainbow. RuPaul. There's a People of Pride series from Little Bee books. And look at this. I love this so much. And some of your kids may be watching RuPaul's Drag Race, which is awesome. Spirit Day, a book about spreading joy about how we can all make a difference, again, without being annoying and, you know, um, uh, tokeny or pedantic. And the representation we have on this cover is fantastic. Um, Kiona, what do you, as I call you out, sorry. Um, so for me, this this feels representative versus token. It doesn't feel like anything is not organic. So do, how do you all feel about this cover? It doesn't have to be Kiona, sorry. Yeah, anybody's welcome to unmute if you have a thought about this cover. And if not, that's okay. So look at that. It, oh, did I hear something? Like, yeah, I like how um, it looks the, on the cover. It looks diverse. Um, I also noticed is the, like the baby, is that a hajib the baby has on at the bottom or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, yeah the hijab. I'm on the cover. Yeah. Yeah, and the girl in the wheelchair. Oh yeah, I didn't even see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it looks pretty diverse on the cover. Yeah, except, which is nice, right? It's a good start. It's a good entry. Yeah. And um, we judge books by their cover. And when I run book clubs, that is the first thing we do with any book we're going to read is we judge it by its cover. I tell them we do not judge people by their covers. That is what that saying means. But book covers, are you kidding? The amount of time and energy and money that goes into designing them, we're supposed to judge them. So let's do it. Um, Drum Dream Girl. OK, anything by Margareta Engel is fantastic. She is from Cuba, and I remember seeing her at a presentation, and she was just in tears. Uh, Obama, President Obama, had just opened up things to Cuba, which made a difference for her because her she could not send things to her family from her name um, from America to Cuba. It would be opened up and often taken away. And this is about a girl in Cuba who girls don't play the drums, right? This is what she's told. This is a true story. Um, Margaret Engel does quite a few books about um, Cubans that we don't know anything about because we're not on it at all. Um, so her books are a wonderful entry into learning about people from Cuba. Um, and this is about a girl who became a great drummer um, against, you know, societal pressures. Now we're going to get into our not recommended. Oh, I have 11 minutes. <laughs> and this came from American Indians in children's, excuse me, in children's literature. The original Clifford's Halloween did not have culture as, um, as costume. I think I have the costume here. Then, sorry, jarring. Is that jarring? I'm so sorry. I actually should have said trigger warning um, because that is jarring. So in the original book of this, Clifford was not dressed in native dress. And for whatever reason, when Scholastic reissued it, and know that you can write to Scholastic publishers and tell them, hey, you know what? not buying this book. This is not okay. They reissued it with this stereotypical culture as costume. Um, and it is jarring and it's disrespectful. And especially when you're getting close to Thanksgiving, which is a highly problematic holiday anyway, keep an eye on all the children's books that have the stereotypical costumes for uh, Native Americans or for indig Indigenous people. Um, and you can see the credit down here is uh, Dr. Debbie Reese's blog and website. Five Chinese Brothers. Anybody know this book? You probably read it. And why is it not recommended? Beth's shaking her head. <laughs> okay, Beth, I'm going to put you on the spot. Why is this book not recommended? Oh, it's, gosh, the stereotype, stereotypes and uh, I... Yeah, I, yeah I, I, I remember reading it as a kid or having it read to me. I look at it now and I think, oh my God, I, it's 
just horrible. Look at the, even the front cover. I don't remember anything about it. The only thing it screams to me is stereotypes. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, Kiana, I see you're, you're not that I'm calling on you, but I just saw your little, the little box go around you like you were talking. Um, I'm looking at the authors too, and they don't seem like they would yes. be representation of someone who could speak from that culture. Exactly. Agreed. Yes. Agreed. Um, so to horrify you even more, I work in a lovely independent bookstore, which is, as I call it, the most dangerous job on earth because I lose money every time I go into work. <laughs> it's not good. Um, working in a bookstore is bad and wonderful. I work for Books Inc. We have a very forward thinking company culture. It's wonderful. We don't have, I learned from our owners that um, uh, the sign we we reserve the right to refuse um, service to anyone. We don't have those in our stores anyway, because they're kind of rude, but they're also what came out of the Jim Crow South because it was a way to enforce segregation in a semi-legal manner. So that we reserve the right to refuse service to anyone has incredibly racist roots. And in Books Inc., which is a bookstore I love, every year, during Asian New Year, and let's remember to call it Asian New Year, not Chinese New Year, because it is Asian. Um, they have this book out every single frigging year. And every year I say, no. <laughs> oh. The plot of the five Chinese brothers is that they are interchangeable because they all look alike. And so they can all pretend to be the same guy. I know I'm lo loving watching the best face in the corner. She's like, no. So yeah, no, we have eight minutes. Watch me go. Parker looks up. Here is one of the things that happens. Again, as I talked about Kadir Nelson, that Parker looking up at the portrait of Michelle Obama, and this is Parker Curry, real, real little girl, and I hope we all saw that beautiful iconic picture of her staring at our amazing former first lady. And it's wonderful. And it's and we would say this is great, and there's representation, and yay, and we're seeing how representation matters to little Parker Curry, and that's really cool. Um, and we have a thing uh, here in the in the on the peninsula in the South Bay called Silicon Valley Reads, and there's books for every age. Parker looks up is their picture book. I emailed them and said no, 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 no. And next time, put me on your committee, and I will help you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, and I'm going to, and this is going to be triggering again, I'm going to tell you, show you why in a minute. Also got this from Dr. Debbie Reese. This is how I learn things. So Parker is running through, uh, I think it's the Smithsonian, and this is actually not in the same building, but she's running through with her big sister, or her little sister, and sees this portrait and feathers are coming out. And she literally says, feathers, look at all the feathers. So if this is what the portrait looks like, there's still some questionable feelings to calling out feathers on an a indigenous people's painting. But if you look at the painting above, that's the original painting. The illustrator chose to add feathers and they chose to highlight it as part of the text. Um, also, as, as Dr. Reese points out, the difference in size of these two portraits is, is huge. Um, and this is, I believe, not in the same museum as the Michelle Obama painting. So when you're, when you're focusing on one ethnicity, but you're othering and stereotyping another, it's not good. So that's why Parker Looks Up is not recommended, unfortunately. It, it, stays, in my, it stays in my book talk crate to talk about it. A fine dessert. I told you we would come back to Sophie Blackall. You may have been shaking your head again. Not recommended. This is the book that started the hashtag slavery with a smile. Um, should have been lovely. Four centuries, four families, one delicious treat. It's about, I think, blackberry cobbler. Um, it could have been great. It really could have. It's interesting to st study a dessert that has come through the ages relatively unchanged, except during the times of enslavement, the story, and it did have one of those where I turned the page and just my jaw dropped. The mom and daughter are making this for the enslavers. They're hiding in a closet and smiling while they eat some. Now they're hiding in a closet because if they're caught eating the enslavers food, they will probably be beaten. 
we get to a two page spread where the white people are sitting at a table eating and there's a little um, black boy pulling the fan and he's smiling. Really? Really? So no, 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 no. Also, and I'm running out of time. I, okay, talking faster. Sorry, Alba. Here's the thing that happens. There was a book that came out and then pulled called A Cake for George Washington. It was about George Washington and his enslaved people. The editor on that book was Andrea Davis Pinckney. We've heard the Pinckney name. I love Andrea Davis Pinckney. She is flipping brilliant. She is, yes, a, a an African-American editor and author, and she cleared a book that was not okay. We're all learning. So sometimes own voices or even backgrounds, we miss things. I'm always learning, so keep checking things out. We are going into resources with three minutes left to go. If you have questions, let me know. At the very end, you will see my email. Please email me with comments, questions, books that you love or books that you hate. Kiona, I would love those titles if you have them. Um, Lee and Lowe, for the most part, is great. They are all about multicultural uh, creators. They do a good job. There was a book that I have to find. I just took a class on transracial adoption in Asia, uh, Asian adoption in white culture, and Lee and Lowe got one wrong. Um, Teaching for Change is fantastic like the anti-bias books. This is Redeen Sims Bishop's quote, she, that we have to see ourselves, we have to see others. Um, School Library Journal, which should be a really good journal about things, on their cover on, on uh, diverse books, had a white child reading a diverse book, holding a book up with a, a African-American face on the cover, which one made the child look like she's wearing blackface, which, oh my God. And two, makes diverse books, their framing of diverse books is this is how we teach white children. No, 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 white children are not the focus. Like this is great, they need, we need sliding glass doors and windows, but don't make multiculturalism about white people again. We need diverse books, great group. American Indians and Children's Literature, which I keep bringing up because it kicks booty. LGBTQ book, AIA books. Um, ALA, American Library Association, has all kinds of different groups. This is the Gay, Lesbian, Bi, Trans Roundtable is a group that puts that out. Disability in books, again, those are the Schneider Awards. American Psychological Association, oh good, I did spell that right. They have their own publishing arm which is amazing. They don't, it's called Imagination Press. They don't turn out a lot of children's books, but they have some. Book Riot, this is one list. This is their LGBTQ list um, as a resource. They have a lot. They are a review journal. Cora Bell Prey, as I mentioned, Credit Scott King, um, that's me. So we have literally one minute. Questions, thoughts, complaints? Yes, there's, there's a question. Do you have a Filipino American picture? Yes. Um, sorry. And really, don't release me around children because I have a potty mouth. Um, oh, God. I can see it. I will have to find it for you. It was, there are not a lot, but there are some, and I will find them, and I apologize for leaving them out. Um, Children's we'll Book just, Press had a couple. Yeah, I will, we can just, we, you can let us know, and then we can send it out when we send out the links to the... That would be great. The and the one, one of the ones I'm thinking of is in English and Tagalog, which is really cool. But yes, there are some, not as many as we need, but there are some, and I will get that list to you. Wonderful. Any other questions, thoughts, complaints? I am open to complaints, except for you, Elise. Do not complain at your mother. <laughs> Actually, she can. That's how I learn. And I'm looking in the chat. I, oh, thank you for the thank yous, y'all. Um, if you think of anything, let me know. Uh, oh, and Crystal, you have a plug that's wonderful. So I will have to go look at that. So yes. everyone check out Crystal's book. Yes. Thank you so much, Sharon, for this thank wonderful you. training, this great resource. It's, 
this will be on our uh, website. I put it in the chat earlier. You just Google First Five Alameda County YouTube and you'll find it and you'll find you'll also receive a link uh, once we have it all packaged up. And um, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you all, yes. It was great to see you all and um, mm -hmm. good to see old and new friends and Dr. Stroud giving you a little wave there. So thank you all, everybody. And um, we look forward to seeing you guys next time at our next training. And thank you again, Sharon, so much. You're a wealth of knowledge. Thank you. It's so fun. Really appreciate it.